Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. <clears throat> we stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. Now, I know you're going to say, but I didn't see you Wednesday <laughs> or Monday or the week before. <laughs> well, the reason is I've been gone. There's been some conferences that uh, I have been attending, and so it was a time for me to be fed to focus and receive from the Lord. So I appreciated your patience and your understanding. And I know that I'll have to build up my fan base in a sense. Not that I need to be anybody that needs a fan, except for cooling me off. But I know that uh, when you leave like that, people tune out and then they forget about you that quick. And so I know I'll have to <clears throat> build up that group again. So uh, here's something that can help, by the way. If you are watching me on Facebook, which most of you are, you can actually do a watch party. So if you look down <clears throat> at where you're watching, it will say watch party. Just click that and then it, uh, go ahead and post it. And it will then invite all of your friends on your Facebook to watch. Now, some of them will get on and they'll just get off because they go, oh, religious stuff. But that's okay. Uh, some will stay on and actually uh, learn something about Christianity. And so my hope is, is that <clears throat> as they stay on, they'll see the truth of Christianity and not what they've heard from other type of ministries, but what they're hearing just simply straight from the Word of God. I am not one of these charismatic teachers. I don't get into all of these great stories, though I have some stories. Um, I just like expounding upon what the text says within the context so that we know exactly what God is saying. You don't want to know what I have to say. What I have to say is it's not worth a hill of beans. <laughs> I mean, you can't take that to the bank and even get a penny for it if you were to take what I had to say. But what God has to say, psh, that's like Fort Knotts. And it will revolutionize your life if you really hear what the word is saying receive what the word is saying and then apply the word and so that's my hope is that we truly understand not in a religious sense but in a relationship and i pray for healing that god will bring healing to hearts healing to souls restoration uh, and even salvation to many others so if you get a chance just push that little button there that says watch party and Follow the steps and you'll begin a watch party along with uh, many others. So let's go ahead and, and pray. And if you are in the neighborhood and like to join us here, as we have a few here in the church every time we gather together, then you're more than welcome to join us at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. And this morning we're in the book of Ephesians. So if you want to get your Bible and a cup of coffee, a piece of paper, pencil, or a highlighter, whatever way you want to do it, and just follow along. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we now ask that you would anoint us with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, that you would just give us insight to your word and your word alone, Lord, yes. within its context, Father. <clears throat> we pray, Lord, that you would teach us the very heart of God, that we may know our purpose and our call in this yes. life, Lord. We pray that you encourage others, Lord, because... There are so many things that are going on in this world, Lord. So many heartaches. And people are hurting. People are doubting. Whether it's physical pain and suffering, or whether it's spiritual suffering, Lord. Maybe a loss of a loved one. Uh, maybe even in their relationship that has been broken, Lord. And I pray that you bring healing today, Lord, through your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Okay, so we're in Ephesians, and we are in chapter 5, chapter 5. So just to give a, a quick, quick little recap, because I know there's so much here that um, we can go over, that we might go over a, a half an hour, and I don't want to do that, so I want to go through it rather quickly. So Paul, in, in chapter 4 through chapter 6, is dealing with our sanctification, what do I mean by sanctification, which is just a word to describe the work of God in our lives that is done by the Holy Spirit. 
he is trying to set us apart from the world and set us apart to him. That is his job. And we are to just receive and to be obedient to that leading of the Holy Spirit, which takes the power of the Holy Spirit to do. And so in chapter 4, we were instructed on how to be in unity with one another, with God, putting on the new man, taking off the old man. And in chapter 5, we have a, a variety of topics here that Paul is going to instruct us to love one another, instruct us about the fruit of the Spirit, instruct us about wives and husbands and, and, and children. And so we have a lot. <laughs> and I wish I could take a lot more time, but we're just going to skim over this very briefly. So let's go ahead and, and start in verse 1 of chapter 5. Therefore, be followers of God as dear children. Now, he didn't say be followers of the Apostle Paul or of Peter or any of the apostles. He said be followers of God. So the Ephesian church, which, which was very much involved in the cultural challenges of that time, which was idolatry, uh, false worship, sexual immorality, and various things that we deal with today. They were challenged in, in, in living in that time and that culture. Uh, they could have followed anything, anyone uh, that had the perfect gift, was charismatic and so forth. But Paul made it very clear that we are to follow God. God. Good morning, Patty. <laughs> now this is important, guys. This is important. We're not to follow anyone else but God. Now we know that God is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And so we're literally to follow Jesus Christ. You're not to follow me. In fact, if you put me on a pedestal, shame on you. Because I shouldn't be on a pedestal. I'm not God. I'm a man just like any other man. And my role is to pastor and lead the church. Amen. Shepherd the flock. That's it. If you put me on a, on a pedestal and you lift me up, guess what? You'll also be the one that will knock me down. Because as much as you lift me up, you probably will see that I'm really not a person that you should be lifting up. And when you see my flaws, you'll knock me right off that pedestal. And so just keep me at the bottom. Don't lift me up at all. I'm a man, just like you. We're all trying to follow God, right? Yes. Now, doesn't mean that I don't have authority in the church, that I shouldn't run the church and do the best that I can and so forth. I'm going to do that as a steward, right? And we should love one another. In fact, that's his whole point here. So let's follow God first. And of course, that following God is not in a religious sense, right? We don't do rules and regulations here. You don't follow God by coming to church. Okay, I'm following God. I'm reading my Bible. I'm praying. You know, I'm giving. And as long as I do that, I must be following God. No, 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 no. It is in the sense of having a personal relationship with Him. Okay? So you have a personal relationship with God, and so you desire to know Him, follow him with Him, follow Him, and walk with Him on a daily basis. He says, walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and given Himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. So He gives you the example, Christ who gave up his life for us. So we must walk in love with each other. Again, not in the sense of religion, but in relationship. <clears throat> it's easy to look at one another's sins, right? We can pick out sins uh, so quickly on, with someone. You know, oh, he didn't say that word right. You know, <clears throat> you know he's not dressed this way, you know. Uh, he missed Wednesday night. Uh, he missed the devotion. Uh, and we start looking at these things and we start judging them. And that's not love. In fact, the Bible says love covers a multitude of sin. So instead of looking at the flaws, look at the possibilities. Look at what God's doing through them. It's all about the perspective of Christ. It's called a relationship. And our relationships with one another is one that we walk with each other in a sense of forgiveness. Always forgiving one another. Overlooking sin. Now, <clears throat> doesn't mean that if it's gross immorality and it's purposely done that you overlook it. Obviously, we have flaws. We stumble. We fall. We say things. You know, I, remember, I remember one time I was talking with a brother and I used that 
word that I didn't realize at the time what I was saying, but, you know, uh, we say, uh, stop kissing up to people. But there's another way of saying it that gives you a description that's pretty gross if you think about it. And I used that description. And I walked away, and as I was walking away, the Holy Spirit convicted my heart and said, do you know what you just said? And so I'm like, well, I can't believe I just said that to an elder, you know, of the church. And so I turned back around and I, I went back to him and said, you know what, I want to apologize. I didn't realize that what I said and what I described was so awful. And so I apologize for that. And he said, oh, don't worry about it. You know, and he was very kind, very kind, very gracious. And our relationship was still there, you know, even though I had said something. Um, I was aware of it through the Holy Spirit, that it was not a good thing. And so I was able to go to him and express my, forgive, you know, forgive me, please. And he did. And I learned a lesson at the same time that you have to be careful what you're, what you're saying. So we need to be like Christ, a sweet smelling aroma with one another. He goes on now and he talks about the old nature here and how we're not to do these things. Look at verse 3. Fornication and all uncleanliness or covetousness, let it not even be named among us or you that is fitting for saints, neither filthiness, foolishness, foolish talking, foolish talking, or coarse gesturing, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Those foolish talking, coarse gesturing, uh, that's stuff that the world does. They cut each other down and they think it's funny. You know, uh, if I can cut you down. Uh, what the, Hollywood calls it what? Roasting? They have the roast. You ever watch a roast? They get pretty explicit over some things and they, it's like, it's pretty bad. And if you were on the streets, those are the kind of words that you'd probably fight for, you know, because of the things that they've said. Um, that shouldn't be among the believers. Now, I get it. We're, we're, we're human. We like to joke around. We'll make fun of things, you know. Uh, people do certain things. They have certain traits, and we kind of expound upon those things, you know. It's like cartoonists will, will take a picture of someone like Trump, you know, and he's a president, and they'll, they'll amplify an area that just seems to be funny, like his hair. So you'll see a picture of him, and then his hair is like, whoosh all over the place and there's surfers in there surfing you know and things like this because you're just and you start laughing because it's so true and so we have a tendency of doing those things but we need to be careful because a lot of times those things are not um, edifying they might be lawful but they're not necessarily always good so he says be careful of foolish talking coarse gesturing which are not fitting but rather give thanks for this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of God, uh, in the kingdom of Christ of God. Now, those who practice those things and it's a part of their lives, they're not going to heaven. And that's very clear. And by the way, that's, that is a separation there, isn't it? And Paul is very clear. And you see what Paul hearts is. There's a heaven and there's a hell. He makes that clear in that statement. And, and those who practice these things are not going to heaven. So where are they going? to hell <clears throat> so so we need to understand there's another place besides heaven and not everyone gets to go to heaven and if you're practicing these things and you call yourself a christian then you need to re-examine your life now it's not that you're saved by not practicing these things but it's a matter that it offends relationships it offends relationships it breaks relationships and god's about relationships he's not about laws that we perform, he's about relationships uh, uh, that are based upon grace and mercy. Uh, and so it destroys relationships. And that's why he says we shouldn't be doing these things. And some of you know this. You try, try committing adultery. And, and you tell me if your spouse is going to say, hey, I really appreciate that, you know, you're a loving, caring guy, you know. No, it's going to destroy your relationship. Try coarse gesturing with someone long enough, and eventually it'll destroy that relationship. You know, we know those things. So be careful. Uh, let no one deceive you with, you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the, in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Now, notice he says fruit of the Spirit. It is fruit. 
Fruit is a natural byproduct of what something is, right? What a tree is. You get oranges from an orange tree. It is the fruit of being an orange tree. You get peaches from a tree being peach tree. You get peaches. You don't get almonds from a peach tree. You don't get apples, you get peaches. So in this sense, what he's saying is, because you're believers, because you know Christ, the natural byproduct is goodness and truth and righteousness. That's the natural byproduct. Now this is important for us to understand because we can, we can do a work in our flesh and say we're good by doing good little works and then think of ourselves, we're good people. Look at, I help over here every Sunday. Look, I do this once in a while over here, so I'm a good person. But the Bible says your heart is wicked. Every heart is wicked, Isaiah says. Who can know it? There are none that are righteous. No, not one. We need to understand that. And I don't think we truly understand that completely, that we're so wicked. One of the speakers, uh, he was a, a doctor, <clears throat> a scholar, and he got up there and he said, I am just so humbled humbled by the opportunity to, to be up here and share with you guys. He says, because I am, I am an idiot. I am an idiot of idiots. I don't know anything. I mean, I, I don't deserve, and he went on and on. Now, if you were to say that, like in my church, and I've said that before, not an idiot, but I've said things similar to that. You know what I oftentimes get from people? You should stop putting yourself down. Why do you keep putting yourself down? Ah, they don't understand. They don't understand. They do not understand. They think they're someone. And they think when you're someone, you shouldn't put yourself down. No, it's not putting ourselves down. It's realizing who Amen. we are. It's a realization that all of us are sinful. All of us at any moment can rob a bank. <laughs> you know, If we had the courage and strength and we'd walk in there, how many times have you thought about robbing a bank? I've walked in banks sometimes and look around and like, I could rob this place, you know? And it's, it's the heart, you know? Uh, I, you know, I could, get rid, I could get rid of someone really easy and no one ever find them. But of course, that's what they all say, right? And then they end up getting busted. So, but the Bible says, and that's, that's our grid of truth. The Bible says we're all idiots when it comes to God and spiritual truth. And I love that about him because when he spoke, he spoke from brokenness. And I don't know if you know what that means. He spoke from brokenness. He realizes that he can't do anything good. And that if anything good comes from him, it's because Christ is in him. And as he spoke, he spoke with a humble voice, not a powerful one, but one from love. And I remember um, talking to him. I just had a couple of questions and he was just like, oh, dear brother, put his hand on me. I can feel his brokenness in, in his touch and in his voice and that he was a man that was broken by God and that God was just using him in such a great way. Um, it was just really, really refreshing. That's the fruit of the Spirit. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Um, and if we're trying to produce that by thinking that we can do little righteous works and, oh, I must be a Christian. No, you got it wrong. We are Christians because of the grace of God. Amen. That's it. That is it. It has nothing to do with our righteous acts or us being good compared to someone else. He goes on, proving what is acceptable to the Lord. Verse 11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. So there's them, that's them, and we're us, right? And us should not be fellowshipping with unfruitful works of righteousness or unrighteousness of darkness. We shouldn't be dangling in the world and doing those things. What things are that? Well, what he listed. We shouldn't be uh, thinking filthiness, foolish talking, gesturing. We shouldn't be coveting others' things, having idols, having an unclean thought <clears throat> uh, or spewing out lies or hatred or anger and those things. We shouldn't be doing those things. And we should correct ourselves. As I shared that story, I turned away. The Holy Spirit said, do you know what you just said? Ah, Lord, forgive me. And I went back and immediately asked for forgiveness. And I learned a lesson. And I don't use that picture anymore. You know, I try to stay away from that. 
And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He exposes those things. Verse 13, <clears throat> but all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, wake up you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. And so if you're not walking this way and you've been asleep, then wake up, guys. It's time to wake up, get back into the church for the right reasons. Not because it saves you, but because you want to be in church. And that is a big difference. And unfortunately, we live in a day and age where people don't want to be in church. How do you know that people don't want to be in church? Well, because they're not here. That's pretty simple. Well, but you don't know. They, they might be busy. Ah, okay. Well, then what are they busy doing? Well, they got soccer. Well, they got football. Okay, then they don't want to be here. They want to be there. They want to be there. Oh, but they, they worked hard Saturday night, so they're sleeping. Okay, so they want to work hard. That's where they want to work. That's where they want to be, not here. See, if you want to be somewhere, you're going to be there. You're going to be there. Amen. You remember your first love? <laughs> you were there, right? When you fell in love, that's it. Forget everything else. My granddaughter's in love right now. She's getting married in October. And you can see it, and I remember it. She's forgotten everybody except this guy. <laughs> you know, it's all him. She is madly in love, and, and, and her world right now is him. That's her world, and everyone else does not exist, you know, except that come and be a part of my world and celebrate with what I have right now. I'm in love. And so we ought to be in love with Christ like that. We need to want to be in church. We want to fellowship. We want to be a part of the ministry. You want to. Otherwise, if you're doing other things, then you really don't want to. And that has to change, guys, because that's the air in our walk with Christ. And that's the air that we see taking place in the church today. Not just our church, <clears throat> by the way. You might think that our church has gotten smaller. It's not just our church. It's a lot of churches. A lot of churches. Because people are tired. They're tired of religion. They want relationship. And that's something that I want to teach more about is relationship with Jesus Christ. He goes on, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand that the will of the Lord is, and do not be drunk with wine in which is dispensation, but be filled with the Spirit. So again, the leading of the Spirit. So let's close up with the rest of these scriptures here. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melodies in your heart to the Lord. You get that funny picture, right? Someone walking around. -da 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 -da. The Lord is good. Speaking psalms and hymns. That's how we ought to be. No, not silly like that. But we should be joyful, rejoicing, thanksgiving, so forth. Giving thanks always for all things to God. The Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in fear, in the fear of the Lord. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be subject to their own husbands. Now, that's a truth. That's a truth. Now, yes, as it said in verse 21, submitting to one another, we always submit to one another. We are actually submitting to truth. If you bring truth to me, then it's my responsibility to submit to the truth. I'm not submitting to you, but I'm submitting to that truth that you've brought to me. And in a sense, you might think, well, he's submitting to me. No, I'm submitting to the word. Because if you also brought to me some untruth, things were incorrect, I wouldn't be doing it. And so I'm not gonna submit to that truth. But unto the Lord, yes. But it's also true that husbands are over their wives. And they want, the wives need to submit to their husbands because we see that Christ is the head of the church and the churches submit to Christ. So it's an example. It reflects Christ. It's about relationship there again. It's about relationship. Your marriage speaks spiritually about the marriage of Christ and the church. That's a great responsibility, guys. That's something you should think about. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify, cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So 
husband's responsibility is to love their wives like they love themselves. Well, how does a husband love himself? I think it's different for everyone. You know, if you're a person that, that takes care of your outer body as a man, then you should take care of the outer body of your wife, the way that you love yourself. If you brush your teeth, comb your hair, then you should provide the uh, products that your wife would brush your teeth and comb her hair. If you like sports uh, and you spend money on sports, then you should spend some money on your wife and the things that she likes. If you're a person that spends a lot of time doing things other than with your wife or your family, then you should spend time doing things with your wife and your family too. So whatever way you take care of yourself, take care of your wife also is what he's saying. Now again, that's about relationships. You might think, I don't want to. Well, then something's wrong with your heart because you should want to. We all should want to. What changes that? I don't want to, to want to. Well, what changes it is the relationship with Jesus Christ. It all stems from that root of Jesus Christ. And the more that you're in love with Jesus and rooted well in him, then the more that he will ooze out of you in your other relationships. For no one ever, look at verse 29, guys. Oh, highlight this. Put a little note there because this is the truth. This is the pinnacle of truth when it comes to this whole idea of self-love. When it comes to this whole idea of, um, oh, uh, um, I can't think of the word right now. When we cherish ourselves, you know, and, and we lift ourselves up before others. Paul says, for no one. What does that mean, no one? That means no one. <laughs> Not one other person. No one ever hated his own flesh. There's been no, well, wait a minute, Pastor. What about that person who commits suicide? I, I think they don't like themselves. What about that? No, 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 you don't get it. No, that person loves themselves so much that he can't take it anymore, so they kill themselves. That's really self-love. That's the epitome of narcissism, is that they take their own life, and that's from the pit of hell. That's because they love themselves. I don't like the way people are treating me. I'm better than that. I don't like the way life has been. I'm better than that. I don't like these pains and sufferings. I'm better than that. It's not fair. I deserve better. It's, you know what? I can't take it anymore. I'm going to kill myself. That's self-love. Now, I would argue <clears throat> that somebody that has some mental issues and challenges might not understand it as self-love because of their, their, their chemical imbalance in their mind and so forth. So I would probably argue that that person may not be in their total right mind if they were to commit suicide. Um, I would probably argue that. But pretty much Paul said, not one person ever ate his flesh, but nourished and cherished it just as the Lord does the church. So he gave us an example. This is how the Lord cherishes the church. He loves it. He loves it completely. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. Now tell me that doesn't speak of relationship. That's relationship. To be a member of a body of flesh and bones, that's talking about we are a part, we're one with Christ. And these are the same words that you see in Genesis chapter two. That a husband and wife are to cleave to one another, become one flesh, one body, one bone. <clears throat> and he even says, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the shoes shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that he what? That she respects, honor, esteems, reverence, feels deep respect and love for him. That's your responsibility. And a husband is to love the wife. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is impossible, Lord, for us to do these things. I can't do this, Lord. But I'm not going to lose heart because you can do it in us, Lord. If we submit to your spirit and to your will. We know these things, Lord. And now we're praying, Lord, that we would somehow allow you to get a hold of our emotions that tries to lead us away from the truth and the application of it. 
Would you reel in our emotions and our feelings, Lord? Help them to be less and help the truth logically be understood and applied to our lives, Lord. And let the emotions be based upon truth, Father, that when we respect our husbands, when we love our wives, Lord, that that emotional sensation would be so overwhelming that we're pleasing to the Father. We need your help, Lord. We can't do this on our own, Lord. I'm not expecting anyone to do this on their own, Lord. I don't think we could even attempt it, Father, and achieve it, Lord. But, Lord, we can do it with you because we are one with you, Lord. We're one body, one flesh, one bone with you, Lord. And so, Lord, you work in us and through us, Father, to achieve the natural spiritual fruit that we should be, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate that. Hopefully you got somebody to join you on your watch party. But please share this on your Facebook afterwards. You never know who will be touched by it. And someone might see a glimpse of Christianity and what it really is to be a Christian. Uh, God bless you. If you have any prayer requests, please post them or private email me and we will pray for you as we pray here. Have a wonderful weekend. God bless.